Good evening. Uh, my name is Cecilia Rouse, and I'm the dean of the Woodrow Wilson School. And I, I'm new to the Woodrow Wilson School, and I'm getting to know my uh, duties. But one of the great pleasures I have is that I get to introduce some of the fantastic leaders that come through our institution. And it is such, one such pleasure that I have tonight. So it is my distinct honor to introduce our keynote speaker for this evening, Admiral Mike Mullen. Admiral Mullen served as the 17th Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the President's Principal Pol uh, Military Advisor, from October 2007 until September 2011. Following two years as a 28th Chief of Naval Operations, the Navy's highest ranking officer. Admiral Mullen graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy and has, been, and has a master's in science degree in um, operations research, and he also completed the advanced management program at Harvard Business School. His naval career began aboard the uh, destroyer USS Colette, which took part in combat operations off the coast of Vietnam. And over the course of his 42-year career, he held leadership positions aboard six other warships, including command of the USS George Washington Strike Group. As chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Admiral Mullen was instrumental in integrating special operations forces into the US military activities, including presiding over mi the military's role in targeting Osama bin Laden. He guided the US armed forces through difficult phases in both Afghanistan and Iraq, oversaw humanitarian operations from Haiti to Japan, and built critical relationships with some of the most complex actors in the international community, including Russia, China, and Pakistan. His dedication to the diversity and integrity of the U.S. Armed Forces informed his decision to support the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Passionate about the health and welfare of our troops and military families, as well as their connection to the American public, he and his wife, Deborah, continue to devote much of their time to advancing important support initiatives, including survivor benefits, suicide prevention, mental health, wounded care, homelessness, and veterans' employment and education. Well, we always here at the Woodrow Wilson School think of our students, and he is currently teaching here this semester as the Charles and Marie Robertson Visiting Professor and Lecturer in Public and International Affairs. His class is titled Military and Diplomatic Power, Getting the Right Mix, the topic that is always important and perhaps more critical now than ever. I've heard he's a marvelous teacher. His students are having a wonderful time, and he's clearly a distinguished leader and a dedicated public servant. I give to you Admiral Mullen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that actually reflects what a great experience that it's been for me to uh, come to Princeton. And uh, although I, I do, I am here in some wonderment. Uh, first of all, when I was uh, a very young kid, 17-year-old basketball player in Los Angeles, I actually uh, had a hankering to come to Princeton uh, before I understood the grades that required to do that. <laughs> But at that point in time, uh, Bill Bradley was the best basketball player in the country, and I had great admiration for him. Uh, and it's taken me an awful long time to get here, but I'm delighted <laughs> I, finally was able, I finally was able to do that. And I was really able to do that because uh, Anne-Marie Slaughter uh, and Christine Paxton worked pretty hard to get me up here. And it, although with Christine, I sort of wonder because she, she worked hard to get me here. I show up and she's gone. <laughs> and then shortly after I'm here, because I also spent some time with President Tillman, and sort, sort, I think after my second class, she decides to leave. Um, it really is a great treat. And I, I want to thank uh, Dr. Rouse for her leadership both here and, and in our country. And so many of you, and so many from Princeton who who uh, have served in so many different ways, and the, the, the history here is replete. I also probably would be remiss if I didn't uh, wish you the best this weekend and hope that you beat Harvard. Uh, um, so I, what I'll do here for the next, uh, the, the other thing is so, sort of ground rules. I'll talk for a little while and then open it up for questions. I've been asked by more than one person to come and audit the course. I've got friends that want to come and watch me teach. And so far, I've not let anybody else in the classroom. And actually, a very simple reason for that. I'm only here for the students. Uh, and I think, and you are, I, those of you that are here know this, what a rich 
student body it is and what a great opportunity and privilege it is to spend time with so many capable young people who, from my perspective, want to go out and make the world a better place. And so I really have not uh, um, let anybody else in. And in terms of the questions, I'd like to take questions from the audience, leading with questions from the students uh, initially, and then we'll, we'll uh, certainly extend that. Um, so we've got, I've got basically about an hour. What I want to do is set the stage with uh, uh, a term that I use called strategic ecology. And, and it's str the strategic piece here is important because I think in these days, far too often, we are handling the problem of the moment, and we have a very difficult time getting our head up to look downrange. And we really need to do more of that. Uh, and if I were going to grab sort of that ecology in one word, it would be interdependence. Uh, and I think that applies uh, more so than we realize from a global perspective. And the trends in that ecology include uh, a decline uh, of rural economies, joblessness on the rise, urbanization on the rise, energy demand on the rise, migration, shifting demographics, the rise of gray and black markets, extremism and anti-modernism, climate change, pandemics, water, lack of health care, and cyber dependency. And those are all part of that ecology, if you will. Uh, and uh, in, in the long term, how we address these issues, not just as a nation, but as a globe, and in this interdependence, whether we like it or not, and I think we're going to become more interdependent as time goes on, is absolutely critical. Normally, when I talk to an audience about what's going on in the world, I typically start in the Middle East. Um, when I took over as chairman, that was my top priority because that's obviously where I had two wars. Uh, and it, it hasn't, hoping it would get better, this was in 2007, it hasn't gotten a lot better. In fact, I would argue it's in a much more difficult place right now than it was a few years ago. But I don't want to start there. I'd, I'd like to sort of stick with my theme and see if I can look a little further down the road and start with China. And I'll, what I'd like to do is sort of walk around the world, uh, and for, for those of you, and I'm sure it's all of you that uh, remember what a Venn diagram is, uh, do that in a way in sort of overlapping circles that eventually gets me uh, back here to the United States. But the place I'd like to start is, quite frankly, in, in the Asia Pacific region, and specifically with China, but certainly not just with China. Uh, I'm one who has believed for a long time that, uh, and this goes back from when I first deployed in 1969 off to Vietnam on a ship and in a war, but arrived in Hong Kong and saw a family of 14 living in a little tin hut nailed to the pier. And coming from that nice little cozy place in Southern California, I'd never seen that before. Uh, and the sort of the haves and have nots started jumping out at me uh, in that time. And that's never really gone away. Um, and I'm someone that actually believes that if you're, gonna, if you're gonna solve problems in the world, we're gonna have to have thriving economies. Uh, and a universal standard that I learned from that family, as well as families around the world, uh, right through most recently, is, is moms and dads wanna raise their kids in a peaceful environment, and they'd like, to have it, they'd like to have their kids be better off than they were, to a higher standard of living. And that just isn't gonna be done without thriving economies. And I actually, believe that the most, most important bilateral relationship in the world now and in the future is going to be the relationship between the United States and China. And I believe that principally because we're the two biggest economies. It's going to continue to be that way. And there are tremendous upside opportunities in that relationship simply because of that, given all the other complexities that are associated with that. Uh, and, and certainly I understand that. And those complexities certainly include the kind of challenges that we see right now. Uh, they are military to military challenges. They're challenges in the region. Uh, they're the kind of dependence that we have on each other economically right now, whether it's tied to our debt or our trade and where that goes. Uh, and I think that led well, and, and that's not a given, but led well that there's great upside potential there. And generally, I'm an optimistic, uh, half glasses, half full kind of guy. So, and when I say China, I also, I mean, I broaden that 
quickly to its neighbors. And, and this is somewhat, at least for me anyway, evolutionary in terms of my thinking, which is I think we need to pay not just attention to a country, but when we're dealing with a country, what are the issues associated with the neighborhood? And in particular, what are the issues associated with the neighboring countries of a country like China? Uh, we come from an area, obviously a country that's separated by two great big bodies of water. So we, from my perspective, uh, Americans can oftentimes not have much of an appreciation for borders in particular, particularly when you've got lots of borders and some of them uh, either somewhere between difficult to hostile and you have a rich history of challenges on those borders as we figure out how to interact uh, in ways that are meaningful not just for us but also for a country like China. So we've got great allies in, in South Korea, we've got great allies in, in South Korea and Japan, certainly an, an exceptionally strong area uh, ally in that part, allies in that part of the world in terms of uh, Singapore, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and an emerging uh, and critical relationship with all the countries uh, in ASEAN, uh, which is, a, from my perspective, a very critical alliance that we need to be paying an awful lot of attention to. Uh, and I can talk about issues of the day with respect to, to China, and, and they are directly, and many times, directly related to not just the resource issue, which is certainly uh, a huge challenge because China uh, almost needs infinite resources to take care of the some 800 million people who are without, back to sort of the haves and the have-nots, uh, they have, as I know you know, raised up an economy, or 300 million people, which is almost the entire United States, uh, but they still have a significant portion uh, of their uh, population, which is starting to find out what they don't have and seeking that, and they're in that migration. Uh, so how can we help them with those challenges as opposed to sit on the boundaries and, gee, hope you do well? Uh, I think that's absolutely critical, and certainly the economic piece of that is hugely important as well. Uh, they are at an enormously sensitive time right now in terms of leadership change, and I think we, uh, they, they also have, uh, they've had an election. Uh, they start their turnover here very shortly, uh, the 1st of November, and it's gonna take a while for the new leadership there to get their feet on the ground, as it does in every single country. And I think we've gotta try to understand that and give them some room with respect to this new leadership team, and as has someone who I have great regard for and understands the Chinese have told me, this is the new group, uh, that the, the group that is leaving now, actually not just, in the, not just on the civilian side, but on the military side, uh, they are all uh, moving out for a younger group that have a very different experience. Uh, and I think we need to be sensitive, sensitive and sensitized to that. And so back to neighbors, uh, you don't have to go very far, and then that, uh, clearly we've got our uh, critical, um, critical relationships with, with uh, South Korea and China, and a huge worry in North Korea. And we have, an, and I'm always struck, I mean, I, the student, the average student age here is 21, 22 maybe. The average uh, age of every military unit that we have, the 2.2 million men and women who are serving in the military is 21 years old. There's a 30-year-old that's running North Korea, uh, not very far from being 21. He's brand new, he comes from a family that has been provocative, have, has, has generated provocations in that part of the world historically, and certainly the, based on that, there are concerns that that will continue. Uh, and instability on that peninsula is something that we all need to be very concerned about and work, continue to work with our allies, uh, and all the challenges that exist there to keep that part of the world stable. Uh, and, uh, and that won't just happen, uh, that just won't happen by itself. So and get continued engagement there is critically important. And, and I also believe because of that economic tie that you know, we are in a century now, and I've said this for a number of years, that it, I would call it the Pacific century. Right next door, obviously, uh, to China is, is India. Uh, and also next door uh, is, uh, is Russia. And I'll come back to Russia when I get to Europe. But certainly the relationship that we have with India, which, is, which from my perspective has never been better, continues to emerge. 
uh, is hugely challenged internal to them. And these are countries, India and China, who historically haven't uh, spent a lot of time outside their borders. Uh, that's been their culture. That's been their worldview. Uh, and uh, it, it, is, it is my view that in the world we're living in right now, that gets more and more difficult because of their global engagement economically, because of the, the, their economies and that interdependence I talked about before. So I think all of us, from a leadership standpoint, have to figure out how do we make all these relationships work. And India is a hugely important country, not just because they have a billion people, but because of where they are and because of, the, again, the upside potential that's there globally in addition to the upside potential for their own people. Uh, many of you may know that, that I spent an extraordinary amount of time in Pakistan, and Pakistan's a country that I have worried about and, and continue to worry about. It's, economy, it's a country whose economy is struggling, who who the Islamic uh, extremism continues to grow. It's a country with nuclear weapons, uh, and there are great dangers there. So even as we look to uh, bringing uh, our combat troops home uh, here in 2014 out of Afghanistan, that's not a part of the world that's going to go away. And I'm actually encouraged by the longer-term relationship we have with Afghanistan that the leadership has signed up to in both countries, because I think that that strategic relationship to that area of the world is something that we're going to have to sustain. And, and if you're in Pakistan or in Afghanistan and you're talking to a local citizen, the question on their mind uh, isn't, uh, are you, it, 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 is, it can be, are you going to stay? But the expectation is that, when, really, when are you going to leave? Because we've left them. Uh, each time we've been there in the past. And so sustaining a relationship of support is going to be important, and it's, going to, it's a very difficult part of the world. It is, it has been the epicenter of terrorism in the world. And, and in addition to having a strategic tie with, with uh, Afghanistan, uh, the, I think a long-term relationship with Pakistan uh, is also critically important. And, uh, I think recently what I have seen with respect to Pakistan is movement in the positive direction. It's not easy. It won't be. Uh, there are huge challenges internal to, to uh, the, the country of Pakistan that their leadership is trying to come to grips with, and I, need to th I think we need to be as supportive as possible. And on the military side, which is where I have come from, sustaining relationships with the militaries in those countries uh, is equally important. So as I continue to kind of move out of that part of the world, actually as a neighbor, and this is sort of the Venn diagram piece, uh, the, the, you know, one of Afghanistan's neighbors is Iran. And how we deal with Iran and how the rest of the world deals with Iran, and obviously Iran sitting where it does in the, in the Persian Gulf and where it goes, where this whole issue of nuclear weapons goes, uh, and, and a country that sees itself uh, as, uh, as uh, a country with a rich history, uh, that uh, the Persian heritage is incredibly important to the Iranian people, uh, and how now we're starting to obviously get into what I consider to be the most unstable part of the world uh, in the Middle East. Um, and uh, as I've said for many years, the last thing we need right now is another war in that part of the world. Uh, the trends in that regard are obviously worrisome. Uh, you can certainly see just from what's available publicly that the sanctions are having an enormous effect on the population. What I don't know is whether they will have the ultimate effect that would bring the Iranians to the table to the point where they would, in fact, uh, disengage from their desire or their, uh, on, on their path to acquire nuclear weapons. And they clearly are on that path. Um, so, and, and then, uh, the, the economic side of that with respect to what's there, the resources that are there, even as we, the United States, become less dependent on oil uh, in that part of the world, uh, it's, it's my view, and I think this is something we've got to work out as we move forward, is there's a strategic, there will continue to be a strategic responsibility uh, in that part of the world long term. Uh, Tied, and, and I get that there certainly is a goal, and you can see this in the, in the current campaign, for us to be completely energy dependent in eight, in eight short years. Um, 
uh, which is a wonderful goal, but from a critical part of a place in which there are so many resources and which a country like China is going to become so much more dependent on just because they need more resources. How do we work that out with respect to China? There's, a, from my perspective, a very a significant constructive opportunity there to keep that part of the world stable as well. And I've got many friends, uh, certainly, that are on the, on the other side of the Gulf there that are extremely worried uh, that, uh, that there could be an outbreak there which would certainly destabilize, continue to destabilize the area, and uh, they're very uncertain. And moving, uh, and I'm not here to predict one way or the other. It's a very, very complex and difficult problem. Uh, I think the policy's right from the standpoint of not having the Iranians uh, achieve that capability because I think it starts a nuclear arms race in the Middle East. Uh, and along those lines, I think an area that is v almost completely unexplored is what are we going to do about nuclear weapons in the 21st century? And too often, we are relying on, well, what we did in the 20th century when it was just the Soviet Union and the United States. Those rules aren't going to work. Uh, and I'm as anxious as anybody else to see them all go away on the planet. I'd love to do that. If I could wish them away, I would. That isn't going to happen. There are too many bad players that have them. The technology will pro pro proliferate, which is a big concern about the Iranians getting that technology. So I think we've got to do a lot more work on figuring out what the rules are with respect to the use of or the deterrent effect. How do you deter their use in the 21st century? Um, so, so, I mean, continuing to sort of come from what I call Tehran over to Beirut, uh, which I, feel, I still think is the most challenging and, and unstable part of the world, uh, obviously the centerpiece on that right now is Syria. Uh, and uh, I, just like many other people, am not, I'm not sure where that goes. Uh, I do think we have to pay attention to, obviously, the tragic loss of life I understand that. Uh, back to what I said earlier when I was talking about China and its neighbors, I think that we need to be mindful of outcomes that will be acceptable to the neighborhood as opposed to outcomes that would just be acceptable to us or to one country. Uh, and that neighborhood includes Israel, it includes Lebanon, it includes uh, uh, Turkey, it includes Iraq, it includes Egypt, despite the challenges that Egypt is undergoing right now. And, that, and generating that kind of outcome to, to reach that kind of uh, equilibrium, if you will, is a huge challenge. Um, and, uh, and I don't underestimate the complexity of the country. A friend of mine a couple years ago said something along the lines, if you think the sectarian violence in Iraq was bad, and I was there for that, just wait to see if it gets to, to a level that kicks it off in, a, in Syria. Um, and as I look at the measurements, if you will, of, of uh, is Assad, is it cracking or not, uh, I try, as I have in many countries, to look at how are the elite doing, where's the money, where's the business ties. And what's interesting in Syria is, despite the sectarian cracking at the base, if you will, where most of the people are, the business lines, if you will, uh, and the economic lines blur the sectarian piece at the top. So no matter, no matter what your background is from a sectarian standpoint, uh, it's the economic ties that are actually far more important to you than the sectarian piece uh, at the elite level. Also, another measurement is obviously how the military is staying together. There is, and I understand this, there is this, uh, there has been discussions about the use of a no-fly zone and why I, th well, I think there can be some utility there. Uh, I, I, I don't see it as uh, the kind of utility that solves the problem instantly. And I think we need to, to really be able to answer the question, what next, uh, back to this solution set. And it's not just the immediate neighbors, because there are other countries of, Significance who have tre tremendous interest there, not least of which is a country like Russia. Um, and what we're seeing uh, in Egypt, what we've seen in Tunisia, what, we, what we're seeing in Libya, all those things 
Uh, I think we're, my own view is I think we're in sort of a 10 to 20 year run here. Uh, and we have, and I couldn't tell you the day or the week or the month or even the year that it happened, we have moved from a time of control, which is what the Cold War was, uh, to I think a time of influence. Uh, and I think we need, to, we need to understand and get to the point where we understand we can't control the kind of outcomes that generate the kind of outcomes we used to the way we used to do that. Uh, I've long since uh, believed, a long time ago, that, that we're also, it's a time where we can't do this alone anymore. Uh, and what does that mean, and particularly what does it mean for the Arab awakening when there are so many needs, there are education needs, there are economic needs, there are obviously job needs, uh, there are infrastructure needs, there are resource requirements, there are investment requirements. And what you're seeing specifically from my perspective in a place like Egypt right now, you're seeing a country that was uh, obviously there, it, it's a whole lot different when you agitate for something uh, and then now, and then you get it and now you have to lead that country. And so you're seeing leaders, you know, from certain, from cert with certain backgrounds who you may have expectations based on that background, they'd go in a certain way. From my perspective, they're having to deal with the challenges of leading the entire country. I mean, President Morsi was elected the president of the whole country, and it was 51 to 49, so there are those many with expectation looking to see, uh, Mr. President, you are all of our, uh, the entire population, President, what are you gonna do for all of us, which is a huge challenge. Uh, I also think we underestimate the, the degree of challenge there and in other countries, and also countries who have had incredibly strong uh, leaders in terms of how they run it, whether it was in Egypt or Tunisia or Yemen, and now they move to a more democratic uh, leadership, and they find out, and particularly when over the course of the 30 years or so that the individuals who had been leading that country have eliminated an awful lot of the leaders who might come to the fore, that it's gonna take a while for leadership to coalesce and for these countries to, to figure out how they wanna move forward. And then I go back to what I said earlier about sort of lesson one for me is, how can we help them, help them economically? Uh, and how can, how can they, in the end, be put in a place where they're generating jobs for young people, so particularly on the extremist side, you know, the, the metric for me is if I've got a 15-year-old, are they making a decision to go on, get an education, and contribute to their society, or are they putting on a suicide vest? Uh, and it's at about that age. Uh, and that's the metric, I think, over time that we're gonna have to figure out uh, how to change. Uh, clearly, so all of what's going on there, I think the United States, but not just us, we have to stay engaged, uh, and, and, and there, so much of this is dependent on what's going on internally and our ability, and rightfully so, to reach in, inside internally and affect outcomes uh, is, uh, is either non-existent or incredibly diminished uh, in these countries. And so I think we have to be a little more patient in that regard as these democracies with their elected governments uh, generate their own future uh, and, and figure a way to do that. That's the influence, influence piece as opposed to the control piece. Uh, but I do think it's important to stay engaged and not just sit back and hope for the best. Uh, our relationship just north of there, obviously our relationship forever and in the near term and the long term with Europe is absolutely critical. Not just the economic relationship, there's a values-based relationship there uh, that's, that's huge. Uh, and, and that extends, you know, the relationship piece also extends to, uh, to Russia, which is a huge, uh, which, which has a, hu a very a critical relationship, obviously, with Europe, and in particular, an economic relationship that Europe couldn't do without and Russia couldn't do without. Uh, I was struck recently when I saw the percent of trade uh, between Russia and the United States, and it's like 0.06%. Uh, and uh, in terms of our economy, and it's like two, two and a half percent with respect to Russia. That's not much interdependence or dependence, if you will. Uh, and, and, and so in that regard, we don't have that buffer of dependence, if you will, to kind of work through issues. Uh, and yet I think we're gonna continue to have to do that. Um, 
and and again, as I as, and, and as I sort of come home, I, I, oh sorry, I don't want to forget uh, Africa. Um, Africa is a continent that I think we have to continue to engage, and, and this in particular is true from the perspective of, of those uh, countries, or, or of European countries, who have actually long-standing relationships with many countries in Africa. Uh, and in a way where, where this is a, a wonderful continent uh, with lots of people, lots of resources, lots of scarcities, and, and huge challenges, uh, and we're going to have to, I think, globally figure out uh, how to do that. And I go back to that same, you know, is there a way to get their economies, uh, their governments, their militaries, but particularly their economies so that they can, th that their people can see a better way uh, in the future is going to be hugely important as well. Uh, and then I'd, I'd sort of end that back with us. Uh, and making sure that we're okay. Uh, making sure from a military perspective after a decade of war plus, and we're still out there, we shouldn't forget. I've still got 68,000 troops in Afghanistan. Uh, there will be some who don't, who, who don't see tomorrow. And, and they are the most amazing young men and women I've ever been around over the, in the 43 plus years that I had the privilege of wearing the uniform. And they're just doing what Uncle Sam has asked them to do. And, and thank the Lord, this war, they're not, we're not being blamed for that. And I grew up in a war tour. I started where we clearly were. And I, that is a blessing from the American people that the American people have been so supportive uh, of our men and women uh, in uniform. Um, when I'm asked what keeps me awake at night, which was a frequent question I used to get in uniform and still get, Actually, top of the list for me is our education system, K through 12 in the United States. Uh, I've got students in their early 20s, you know, 10 years, since 10 years before they were born, we've been talking about this system going under. And you can see it in the results interna nationally, internationally, routinely. Uh, and I think that's the biggest long-term vulnerability that we have as a country. Uh, and we've been talking and talking and talking, and it has not changed significantly at all. It is, it's a national crisis, it's a national emergency, and it tops my list for whether we're strong or weak in the long term with respect to our country. So that's at the top. Second for me is the debt. Uh, and I use debt really as a stalking horse for the financial system that we, not the system that we have, but the the financial crisis that we are in. Um, and I have characterized that as a national security issue. I said that over two years ago. I still believe that, and that we've got to get our own house in order, not just to take care of ourselves, but to start to answer the question that I see around the world uh, in terms of, well, who are you these days, United States, from our friends uh, and our enemies? Uh, uh, globally about the change we've been through, the state that we got ourselves into, how we did that, uh, and what does that mean for the future. Um, I'm extremely concerned. A third thing is the, what, I'll, what I call the political paralysis in Washington. Uh, I was there mostly since about 1998. Uh, I mean, I, I was out a couple times, but most of that time between 98 and when I just left, and I've never seen it more paralyzed. I've never seen it worse uh, than, it, than it is right now. And that is not going to, my own view, that paralysis is not, first of all, I'm not sure it's going to get any better. I don't see it. I don't see the signs right now. And secondly, uh, that is not going to generate, po the paralysis is not going to generate positive uh, outcomes for our country. Um, then uh, the fourth thing is the, the world of cyber. Uh, which there are two existential threats that, this, that we have in the United States. And the first one are the nuclear weapons that we and the Russians have, uh, and I think those are well in hand, if you will, with respect to the treaty that we have with them, the New START Treaty, which was, which was recently renegotiated uh, uh, and, uh, and, and is in effect. Um, and I do think those are well in hand. The one that isn't well in hand is cyber. Uh, and you read publicly more and more frequently uh, about the, the cyber attacks. There was a story, I think, yesterday 
that led the news about the Iranians who were attacking us. I assure you that their ca the capability out there is significant. And when I talk about this, I urge leaders in particular to work hard to try to understand the details of this, because leaders make decisions about policy, investment, and people that are engaged in this. And the day is long gone where we can just turn it over to our best technical expert and say, please fix that, and then let me know when my system's back up. Um, so, the, and, and it is a capability that I think can actually bring us to our knees. Now, this is a two-way street. Uh, we are not incapable ourselves in that regard, and we've done an awful lot of work, and I give President Bush and President Obama both a lot of credit for making significant investments in this for the country uh, at a time when it really wasn't as clearly understood as it is now. Uh, but we've got to pay an awful lot of attention to this. It's a space with no rules. Uh, no boundaries, uh, and the players are, you know, from, from responsible players to really evil players, uh, specifically. So that one worries me a great deal. And then the last one, uh, which I got to a, a little bit ago, is really the whole situation in Iran. Uh, that specific situation, certainly in the near term for the next couple of years, as it continues to evolve and what happens there. In, in great hope that leaders from both sides will figure out a way to not create you know, another conflict in that part of the world. So thanks for listening. Thanks for all of, to all of you who are here that pour your time and life into our young people, because I think actually they won't be so young so long, and they're going to be leading this country in the not too distant future, and that's hugely important. Thanks, and I'm open to your questions. Well, I'm, I mean, I used to be pretty heavily involved in all the details of this, uh, and I've, I'm one year out of date in terms of that, so it's pretty hard for me to know uh, enough detail to be able to answer that question. When I, see, when I see the Iranians come to the table, I'm encouraged. That said, they've come to the table a lot in the last several years, and, it, and they haven't stayed for long. So, what I would argue is they need to come to the table and put something serious on the table and stay there through a negotiation that actually moves the ball. The ball is just, it just hasn't been moving as they continue to move closer and closer. And time is on their side in that regard uh, as they move closer and closer, enrich more and more uranium, generate the potential for more capability. There's got to be leaders, leaders, uh, you know, they are, from my perspective, to solve problems, they have to figure out significant substantive steps to take in order to generate a solution. So I'm, all, I'm always encouraged somewhat when I see them come back to the table. I'm, I've always been discouraged that they don't stay there very long. And, I need, and, and the concern I have with Iran in that, our relationship with Iran is we, ha we have not had a conversation with the Iranians in 33, almost 33 years, since 1970, 1979. And the likelihood that the United States and Iran will get outcomes right, particularly if it breaks into conflict, having no communications channels is, I think, pretty slim. Even in the darkest days of the Cold War, we had multiple channels to the Soviet Union. So we could talk, make sure everybody at least understood where we were. That offers much more opportunity to one, not miscalculate, and two, solve a tough problem than we've got with Iran. We have no way to do that right now. <coughs> State of U.S. Foreign, foreign representatives in their campaign and their debates. 
Though your department, though your background is in the Department of Defense, not State, do you believe that the issue of ambassador security should be discussed alongside some of the nation's most pressing issues, or do these questions reveal an underlying anxiety about the state of U.S. foreign affairs? I've got ambassadors here. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think the actually, uh, I think the issue of uh, our diplomacy and how we uh, how we generate that diplomacy and where it's done, and you probably picked up. I'm sort of a we need to be out there and engaged individual uh, is absolutely critical. I don't and that we need to continue to be out there. Um, there's a very fine line and a very careful balance that has to exist between the need to <clears throat> represent the United States of America in a country and in a region, uh, and at the same time do it in a way where people are secure and we don't find ourselves in these kinds of tragic situations where we lost four incredible public servants of the United States. Uh, I don't think Fortress America in Embassy A, B, C, or D is the right answer. We've been through some pretty difficult times in the last 20, 30 years, so I understand the need for security. But I believe that from the, from the standpoint of how I see the United States, there's an ex expectation that we will lead. I think it's a different world than the one we led in you know, over the last uh, 30, 40, 50 years, but there is an expectation we will lead whether, some, whether they, someone likes us or doesn't like us, uh, and I think we need to continue to meet that expectation. Um, so I, I'm, I know that, um, and, and then being out, and I've been in some pretty tough countries, in some pretty tough places, with some pretty heroic ambassadors and foreign service officers, both those who are senior and young people uh, are, that are of the same age, if you will, and background of many of my young people in the military. Extraordinary young people who want to solve problems, make a difference in people's lives, not just represent the United States. So I think we need to do that, and we just have to always be checking to make sure we have the balance right. And it's almost, it's a balance that is uh, specific to every single country. <coughs> A lot of, I'm sorry, a lot of people what? A lot of people feel it was a historic moment and decided to on the, the wisdom of the decision. I guess my question for you is, um, in looking to this, take, walk us through sort of the steps for consideration how you came about making the decision that you did. Um, do you think it was the wrong policy to put in place in 1992, 1993? Um, and if not, then what has changed over the past 15 years or so to make the decision that you did? How much time do you have? Um, from, a, from a leadership standpoint, um, I mean, this is an example, but I could give you others. You know, there, there, is a, there is a time and a place and a synergy uh, and a coalescing that comes together that in, on many issues as a leader that you don't expect. And certainly when I became the chairman, this was not on my scope at all. Uh, um, it was, and, and I, I guess I take you to, to this, the particu this particular issue, my first, my confirmation hearing, Susan Collins, who's a senator from Maine, and I know well because I'm a Navy guy, they build ships in Maine, I had the money for a long time, so <laughs> I had a very close relationship with her, and she's a wonderful, wonderful woman and a, and a great senator. I, she, she was given the microphone at the hearing, and I expected, I expected a uh, question on shipbuilding, and the first question was on don't ask, don't tell, which was, for me, completely out of the blue. But, and my answer was uh, representative of who we are in the military, which is we follow the law. 
And the law in 2007, when she asked me that question, was the law that was put in place in 1993. Now, 1993 for me, I'm at sea, long way away, whatever's going on in Washington is going on in Washington. I'm not paying a lot of attention to headquarters. I mean, I'm aware of it, but its relevance to my life at that point, it wasn't very high on the list. Uh, and again, it, the, and actually even when it finally changed, I couldn't have done the forensics on what happened. I mean, it was that far from me. Uh, and I'm not a very senior guy at the time. I'm sort of in the middle of the pack, if you will, the overall hierarchy in the Navy. But in 2008, it became pretty clear. Now, I am the chairman now, and it became pretty clear that, camp, uh, that uh, candidate Obama was going to make this a priority if he became president. So I started working the issue then, really. Had a small group, put them together, and say, OK, go do the history for me. Tell me how many, tell me what the, all the background in 2000, I'm sorry, 1992, 1993 was. And then we need to start thinking about if, the, if, Pres, if candidate Obama wins, how we're going to address this issue. And then I literally at that point, so this is a year out, or actually it, it, it was a couple years out from when it actually happened. But I literally started then working with my colleagues to say, uh, you know, should the law change, how are we going to do this? Um, so, uh, so again, we and that was a that was a fairly intense effort over a long period of time. Um, obviously, it came forward and it was proposed. The president made it very clear he wanted to do this, but I don't make the law. Neither does the president. Uh, it's Congress that makes the law, and so the. So that you know the the temperature, if you will, or the where the needle is on that is really on the hill, <clears throat> and it worked. You know, we worked over there. I mean, it was over there for a significant period of time. I was I didn't spend much time over there on it, um, um, and and then the hearing came. You know, Senator Levin had a hearing in February of ten, I think, um, and that was where when I was asked, you know, and I'd been through all the work, I knew what I was going to say. That's when I came out uh, and said what I said. And, and fundamentally for me, and I get a great deal of credit, and I understand the courage and all that, from my point of view, uh, it was pretty easy because I grew up in an institution that valued integrity. And for the life of me then and now, I could not reconcile um, uh, the, an institution, that, the, the mix, the conflict in the institution that values integrity and then asks people to come in every day and lie about who they are. And, and uh, not insignificant for me is not just come in every day, but now I'm the chairman, it's two wars, I'm going to Dover, I'm going to Arlington, I'm with families all the time. So I've got young ones making the ultimate sacrifice, uh, including those who were gay and lesbian. Um, and, uh, and so it, for me it became the integrity issue became the centerpiece of the discussion. All of that said, and this is Washington, so that's February. I go, I take the USO to Afghanistan and Iraq every, every Christmas, uh, and I leave on a trip uh, the 9th, I think it was the 8th or 9th of December, something like that. And from my perspective, that bill was dead. This is lame, it was dead, it was going nowhere. That's what I thought, that's how smart I am after all that time in Washington. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, I'm at whatever it is, 35,000 feet coming back from that trip a week later, and it, it, seemed, it passed like that. Uh, and I couldn't even tell you. I, I mean, I, I wasn't counting votes. I mean, it was way out of my lane at that point, but it passed that quickly. And so that, it was this confluence of a lot of people, not just me. It was a president who wanted to do it. It was enough senators to get to 60, uh, uh, which, uh, uh, which made it possible. House having already passed it. So that's some of the trail, if you will. Um, and I've talked, with, I've talked with a lot in the military since it passed, and it's just it's not been an issue. That doesn't mean there won't be incidents. There will, you know, we'll have some difficulties. But by and large, we got a lot bigger fish to fry than that one. Yeah. Student? No. OK, hang on. Student? Sorry. Yeah. Great, great question. Uh, we, we are, I worry a great deal 
about uh, the American people not knowing who its military is. We're less than 1% of the population. We come from fewer and fewer places. And I told you, one, the average age, and two, the best I've ever seen, without any question. And, and uh, I don't know what the median age is, but it's, I'm guessing, 25, 26, something like that for us. Uh, and I bring it up when I was in, I brought it up considerably. Uh, the, the, what I worry about is we have, this is, we're in our 12th year of war. Uh, and we have, in ways, been brilliant, been resilient. 50% of us are married. 80% of us will leave. Normal, this is what you do. You go in for your hitch. It's an all-volunteer force. It's two wars. Uh, and America really doesn't know what we've been through. Uh, America doesn't know that a child who's five years old and his dad was in one of these major army units that made four or five deployments, gone for six months, back for six, gone for a year, back for a year, gone for 15, back for 15 months, gone for a year. So now I'm 15 years old. My whole conscious life as a kid has been at war. That's never happened in the history of our country. If I'm 10, I just came to Princeton, and I don't, have a, I don't know who my dad is, because I haven't seen him throughout what some would argue would be the most critical five or 10 years of your life as a teenager. If, Deb, if my wife were standing here, she'd talk about the stress on families, the spouses uh, who have uh, post-traumatic stress. We call it secondary post-traumatic stress. The kids who are, I think the number a couple of years ago was 300,000 <coughs> mental health scripts going to 18-year-olds and younger in a country that, quite frankly, is, is in many ways drugging ourselves you know, from prescription drugs anyway. But those numbers are up. With a military whose suicide rate, which was roughly half the national average in 2004, that now exceeds the national average, with no end in sight for a couple of reasons. America doesn't spend any time on suicide. America does the same thing that a family does, which is put it in the, lock it away, I don't want to talk about it. 30, I think the number I heard last year was 35,000 suicides in the United States. Um, and we are, in so many ways, representative of the United States. What I do worry about is we've been through a lot the last dozen years. We've been through Gitmo detention, torture, Abu Ghraib, uh, we're into drones now. Um, there have been huge changes. And I would like to see us, at least us, big us, all of us, kind of pause and say, what's happened? What, what are our value-based decisions? Have they changed? Uh, what are the principles that we care about? Or what principles have we not adhered to? And what has that done to us? And have the goalposts moved? I'm not arguing whether they have or not. I just think it'd be a pretty healthy discussion to have to see what's happened. And in this world that we're in right now, where we can't do enough in 24 hours, it's just how much more can I do? And it sort of gets back to that strategic view. How do you step back and look at this? So with respect to our military, these unbelievable people, and I see it in our veterans as well, something like 350,000 a year for the next four years are going to go back to the workplace. 90% of them, 90 plus percent of them, uh, are individuals who have, who have served incredibly well, many of them in combat, and who, who still, even those who have been wounded, the, the, the 40 or 50,000 with physical wounds, those who, who are wounded, some of their dreams, some of their, their abilities may have changed, uh, but their dreams haven't changed. They still want a house, they want a job, they want a raise their kids, good schools, go to school themselves, et cetera. So that American dream is still out there for them. And this, from my perspective, uh, this is the first check this country ought to write uh, with everything else that we got going on for what they've done. And then the, the bigger worry for me, and these veterans are coming back to a pretty tough economy. They're incredibly capable people, disciplined, loyal. Uh, they've led, they're teammates, you know, all those things. They're actually, there's several business cases for hiring a vet 
uh, to improve the bottom line. And I would encourage, and there's a lot of it going on, for many companies, uh, small and big, to look hard at hiring a vet, because that, in the end, is what they want. They don't want, and these are, these are independent, spouses, the same thing. They're not looking for a sympathy card here. Uh, they're not looking for a hand up. They're looking for an opportunity. And I would, I would bet all my money that given an opportunity, they will continue to lead this country, as so many did after World War II. Uh, they want an education, they want health care, and they want employment. That's kind of, the, those are the three things I look at. I worry over the longer term, back to not knowing who we are, and I've seen evidence of this all over the country, that we become a very well-paid force, and we are, with good retirement benefits, and it's please go off and fight our wars and we'll compensate you. Uh, and there are other countries that have done that, and quite frankly, that's not the United States of America. Uh, when we get to that point, and we're not, we get to that point, I think we've got a much bigger problem than we understand. Student. It's not the source, it's a source. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's, a, that's a great question, uh, or, or questions, and my, my mind fills pretty quickly. Um, so let me go back to Don't Ask, Don't Tell and Susan Collins, okay? So my answer to Susan Collins in 2007 was, I believe in this system, and that uh, if this law, which is the 93 law on Don't Ask, Don't Tell, changes, I'll carry it out. And I believe in the system that actually generates that law, and we elect 535 people, to come to town, change, make the laws, change them. You know, that's the democracy, that's the system we're in. And should that happen, I'm there. And that's what I told her. So why then and why now? Because the American people have elected representatives who sent us off to war. And as a military person, I carry out those orders, period. Um, so. And I do believe in that system. Now, I also talked about the paralysis that you know, we, we, I, we need movement there specifically. And they're used to, and again, I, I'm, I'm scarred, I'm old enough, because one, I went there and, and was involved in the war in Vietnam. Uh, I'm, I'm having, having been through that in the, the depths of despair and the difficulties of the country, which were not all Vietnam, by the way, the social upheaval of the time, um, I would get asked in 2005 or 2004, 2005, 2006, we're in Iraq, it's not going well. Um, and I'd, you'd, you'd see the polls run at you and so many people against it. But in the end, that same elected body wrote the check which continued those wars. And so I would argue the American people continued to support it. That's the system, and I'm a big believer in that system. I mean, and it's a great system. Uh, it's not perfect, it's, it's got flaws, but that's the answer. And I wouldn't want it, quite frankly, to be any other way. There are other countries that do it differently, and I've been there, and I wouldn't want to live there. Um, I, 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 the military's, from the military's capabilities perspective, I think we need to be a military that sort of is full spectrum from one of engagement, relationships, trust, that prevents wars. And our engagement is with militaries in other countries around the world. <coughs> this is also, I talked about 
the military we have today, and I've been doing this a long time, it, the, the capabilities, the young people that we have, the capabilities are, are extraordinary. And so we have a lot that we can uh, use to create partnerships, which is what I believe is our big steps in terms of war prevention. And you get in, you can start to pull this apart. What's the relationship of that military in that country to its people and to its political leadership, et cetera. But that's the military's lane. And I think we can be uh, extraordinarily helpful and positive in that regard. Uh, and I go back to the question on Fort, I, the, I talked about Fortress America. I think for all of us just to come home uh, set, starts to set the table for really bad outcomes. So I think we need to stay engaged in the world. I think specifically, I mean, you'll watch the Marine Corps come back to the Navy and get on ships again and, and deploy around the world. I think you'll see the Navy continue to do that, the Air Force continue to do that, and I think you'll see the Army, which has obviously borne the brunt of these wars, the Army and the Marine Corps specifically, uh, that, that you know, they are actually working on their, what I'll call their engagement strategy for the future as well. So I think the military can offer an <coughs> awful lot uh, with respect to influencing outcomes in countries with other militaries who are in a much different position than our military specifically. Thanks, Student? Yeah. Good. <laughs> Not a, are you a freshman? <laughs> <laughs> So I, I went to Pakistan 27 times, I think, which was not my plan when I took over as chairman. Uh, but I believe that for us to be involved in positive outcomes, constructive solutions, uh, for us as a country, we have got to start to see problems through others' eyes and look at it from someone else's perspective and not just give it the American solution. So part, first of all, I'm involved in a war next door. Obviously, I've got bin Laden and his gang living there. Uh, I have a rich, although very conflicted, relationship with the Pakistani military, historically, as we do as a country, uh, over the course of its existence. Uh, and they have some significant needs I think when we go to another country or another individual, uh, the, the, whole, the whole idea is to build some trust, build a relationship that's built around trust. And I think we have to pay a lot of attention to respect and dignity as we think about how I'm going to engage with my counterpart there, who happens to be the head of their army, but also broader than that. Um, and if if we approach it that way, and you've asked about Pakistan, I think it, that's a, those are sort of universal standards. If we do it that way, I actually think that we can move forward. And obviously meeting leaders, being engaged with leaders who have their own needs, and, and we should never forget that there are very few military leaders that I've met in any country in the world that didn't think they were patriots, and whose, whose view was for their own country first not for America or you pick the other country, it's for their own country. Whether I agree with how they do things and what their philosophy is or completely disagree, that's how they see it. And I need to have that in my calculus as I'm dealing with them trying to figure out a way ahead here. Um, and then there, there are this, there's specifics. In Pakistan's case, there's history here. You know, we weren't there for them, and this is how they view it. We weren't for them in 65, 71, we left in 89. And they're just wondering when we're going to leave again. And Afghanistan's the same way. That's based on actions, not based on words. That's why I talked about the strategic agreement with Afghanistan. That's really important. So the message is, we're not leaving this time. And I'm not sure, I, I, we can't be everywhere in the world. I understand that. But, and, and the other thing I think we can think about is how do we do things, how do we create engagements what I call bank shots, 
We sort of like direct shots. You know, we like it to be us. Is there a way to, to create engagements through a third party that makes sense? And I think we need to think more about those kinds of things. Uh, and another aspect of this is we, we don't live in that neighborhood. We get to go and come home. They live there. The neighbors all live there. So this idea of a little broader solution for the neighborhood is something that I think we need to, we, we need to just integrate into our overall approach. That gets back to we can't do this alone either for me. Okay, I think I can take one more question. I, I, I'll take it from one. Huh? Okay, student. Well, the, the, the biggest short-term implication, and it involves defense, but it's not about defense, is the cliff. Uh, I'm not convinced they won't drive right off it. <laughs> and that's depending on which economist you talk to. That's a 400 to $600 billion contraction in our economy. That's an instantaneous uh, move to a recession. I, I'm just not convinced. And that's just based on... I talk about the Pakistanis, you know, what behavior is. They look at behavior. So I'm looking at behavior in some pretty significant situations over the course of the last several years. And so I'm just, I, that's the biggest near-term concern I have, is they'll just drive right off that cliff. Uh, and you can, start, you can start to see the stories that were out, you know, they've been out there, but certainly this morning as well, you can start to see the stories about whether they're going to do that or not. Um, and I just don't know. I don't know. Uh, the longer term, I, I would just talk about the top two, education and the fiscal piece. If we don't start making decisions that make sense with respect to that, we're just not going to be who we've been. We, we, we can't be. We won't have the resources. And actually, we won't be able to compete, which is our great strength. So that's, that's the worry. And as I look at you, uh, you know, 20-something that you are, one of the gravest concerns I have for my generation is, is the, the probability that I would leave my country, which I love, in your hands in worse shape than when I got it is a lot higher than I'd like it, and it's never happened in our history. OK? Thanks.